वैष्णव जन तो तेन कही दे पीड़ पर जाने दे पर दुखे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो ए मन अभिमान रे वैष्णव जन दो सकल लोक मौन बंदे एंदन करे के रे काज मना निजल रागे जन जन जननी से रे वैष्णव जन दो समृष्टि ने प्रश्न त्यागी परी जे ने मात रे चन बोले पर धन न जाले आदरे वैष्णव जन दो In the shadow of the 65-million-year-old Mount Gurnar, there lived in the early 15th century one of India's most revered poet philosophers. Nearly 500 years after he wrote it, one of his songs came to define Mohandas Gandhi's moral universe. It is rare in history that a single song becomes the moral center of one of the world's great political movements. Vaishnava Janato, or The Truly Righteous One, is that song. Narsingh Mehta, its writer, and Mohandas Gandhi, its most ardent proponent. It is arguably one of the most widely sung songs in the world. This is their story. Dr. Tridip Sharud is the director of the Gandhi Ashram in Ahmedabad, India, and also a highly respected scholar of Narsin's works. He has spent decades on the two themes, and in particular about the emergence of Vaishnav Janato as a defining moral standard. If a, a language creates a song or a poem like Vaishnava Jan, the language does not need to create much more. Okay? Uh, you know, a language can, in a, in a thousand-year-old history, can create one work of that kind of merit and and i'm not saying that gujarati language is exhausted by it but it is it is a moment uh, of great cultural uh, creativity uh, which attracts me first also what attracts me is the biography of this man um, nothing uh, you know uh, there is a, we don't have a history of narsi mehta it's shrouded in um, um, various tales uh, a uh, uh, you know whether one believes them or not uh, is not the question. The history of Narsi Mehta that we were taught in school uh, was a story of uh, adversity, injustice and uh, humiliation. His po poverty was uh, uh, laughed at, his, uh, his what at that time was criticized as, as his obsessive uh, 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 bhakti was criticized. He was uh, set challenges which would have been very difficult for a uh, normal human being to live with. And I think uh, like some people find uh, uh, escape in uh, the, the ecstasy of drugs, the ecstasy of creation of a world that was not his world that was denied to him was his form of escapism, his form of escaping into what he would have liked to live in, the times and the society that he would have liked to live in, where 
not his ability to earn lucre but his creativity would have been much more appreciated uh, if we look at if we hear about his history like many other uh, uh, creators his creations also became more popular past his lifetime than within his uh, lifetime and i think this was a form of uh, his 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 uh, imagination put into words what would have been his ideal world what would have been his ideal role in that uh, society were part of all his creations either talking about the the anomalies in the culture of that time or his wish list they were all portrayed in this kind of a, a, a play with words that i think was his shangrila Narsingh grew up in a modest home by a small prehistoric rocky hill in Talaja village. In his time Talaja would have been barely a hamlet of a few hundred people. In Narsingh's father also died. In the solitude of the caves in the recesses of the Talaja hill. It was in this cave that locals believe he first began to ponder deeper philosophical questions even though his main interest lay in the gloriously rich and hedonistic lifestyle of Krishna and his many consorts but mainly one Radha He was profoundly moved by Raslila the captivating dance and music spectacle associated with Radha and Krishna It was early in his adolescence that Narasim began to internalize the idea of the divine as represented in the marble and granite statues of Shiv and instead manifested it within his growing literary imagination. For a poetically and philosophically inclined young man, not savvy in the ways of everyday life, living off an elder brother of limited means and sister-in-law of limitless contempt became too much he found refuge in a pilgrim town of gopnath he ran away from home unable to endure his sister-in-law's regular taunts about his wayward unproductive ways it was almost inevitable that his family would leave for a bigger place in search of a better life the choice fell on junagird an ancient town with a long cultural and religious history because of the presence of mount gurnar and also because of the predominance of the nagars narasingh's brother and sister-in-law reasoned that the family would be better anchored in junagird because of its cultural ecology that turned out not to be the case for narsingh as he became even more nonconformist with the much treasured values and ways of the nagar community and began living outside its rigid norms one of which was not to mix with those of lower social station than his In India's medieval society, highly stratified along castes, it was ironic for someone like Narsingh that he was born among the Nagar community. He was perhaps the first major figure of Gujarat who broke down caste and class barriers by happily spending a great deal of the time with those who were then considered untouchable. He sang for them during festivals and family occasions much to the anger of the Nagar community. A time came when the community seemed bent on destroying, but he emerged unscathed at every turn, continuing with his writing and singing. What prompts this man to break caste norms? What prompts this man to break uh, and and these are the most important norms which define who you are uh, uh, you are your caste in 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 many ways uh, very few people manage to escape uh, their boundedness to caste uh, and he is somebody who is striving to do that he is not the only one who does it but clearly coming from the kind of social milieu that he comes his position within the caste hierarchy being what it was uh, uh, and then to actually actively pursue a different kind of impulse a different kind of desire 
of, of, of a kind of equability that was unheard of, of a kind of equability that uh, even today we can only uh, aspire to and then we haven't come anywhere close to that ideal uh, is something that attracts you. It is like this that uh, uh, if one small stream comes out of Girna, then it merges into river and that it merges into Arabian Ocean. Once you become the ocean, all the other uh, considerations have gone away and you are that unbounded sea, ocean of bliss and therefore uh, nothing matters. As a matter of fact, he was born in what is considered to be the best community at any time because Nagar had 99% of literacy even few hundred years ago. And having generated that culture in his mind, he still could go to the downtrodden and what was called untouchable. Uh, he went to them and he sang with them, he danced with them. And although Gandhi has not mentioned this in his book, but he was inspired by uh, removing the untouchability from the uh, society through nursing method. So he could rise very spontaneously because in this unbounded state of consciousness, whatever comes is spontaneous and that is the desire of the Creator. And at that particular time, the Creator probably wanted the social distinctions to melt away and create a more universal society. Also, uh, what attracts uh, one to Narsimeta is the kind of spiritual journey that he undergoes. Uh, here is somebody who begins within the tradition of what is called Sagoda Bhakti, where the, uh, where the divine is personified. Uh, the divine could have a body. The divine could be imagined as having uh, a body. The divine is embodied. And then to move within the same lifespan of conception of the divine um, in a pure abstraction. Uh, and I mean, it's almost mathematical, that imagination. I mean, I'm, I'm using a very uh, modern metaphor, but it's, it's, it's devoid of anything uh, outside of itself. In that sense, it's a pure number. Uh, uh, so th that's what attracts uh, me to Narsi Mehta. And the, uh, and the fact that it lives on in your imagination, uh, in Gujarat and in other parts uh, uh, also, primarily because of Gandhi that uh, uh, in other parts it lives on, but in Gujarat it lived on before Gandhi and will live on after Gandhi. મશાલ <laughs> <laughs> It is a matter of interesting scholarly debate what made Narsin a poet. Whether the trigger for him was literary or was it his sense of wonderment about the universe and its manifestation in the form of Krishna that prompted him to articulate using poetic imagination? Somebody, I mean, there is this, this is something that has been told of a lot of poets, that uh, they begin with uh, a kind of 
uh, a state which is that of uh, obtuse consciousness of a certain kind of uh, unrefined temperament uh, and something happens and as it were light dawns on them and similar stories are available for a lot of poets including the great Tulsidas or Kalidas and therefore Narsimhetta. Uh, I think it's you know I, I would like to think that somebody who has uh, uh, the relationship to divine does not always require a poetic imagination nor does poetic imagination in every instance require a divine a longing for the divine they are they are part of that relationship but it's not a necessary condition somebody who had that kind of sensitivity to language uh, somebody who had that kind of uh, ability to imbue words with meanings uh, clearly had a poetic imagination clearly uh, somebody who knew how to foreground language uh, even in a divine experience language gets foregrounded so i think he had a poetic imagination uh, which then is uh, rendered in the service of of the divine but in absence of a poetic imagination uh, a, you know a sense of the cadence of language uh, the sense of the rhythm and the rustle of words you can't create uh, the kind of uh, or you could say no it's divinely inspired that he is only a medium uh, and the medium could be anybody right? uh, but i do think that there is an agency of the poet involved he wrote brilliant devotional poetry and profound philosophical ruminations evocative in language and breathtaking in imagery Hundreds of his songs and verses, ballads and poems switched effortlessly between the embodied and the formless conception of the divine. In the midst of such feverish output, he wrote one song that not only survives over five centuries hence, but flourishes with each passing year. Between the mid-15th century, when Narsingh Mehta wrote it, and 1907, when Gandhi made it his life's moral compass, the song pervaded the air of its home of Surashtra in northwest Gujarat state of India. Like all of Mehta's creations, Gandhi's song, too, was transmitted orally and became embedded in the communal memory of the people of the region. They sang it to get into the rhythm of the day in the early morning, or late in the evening before falling asleep to its lofty message conveyed in deceptively simple language. Over the five and a half centuries after it was written by Mehta, the song is now practically one of a handful of India's unofficial national anthems, widely shared by even hundreds of millions of those who do not read or write its original Gujarati language. With Gandhi as its chief propagator and chief follower throughout his political career, Vaishnav Janato is regarded by Indians as the gold standard of what constitutes morally upright conduct. Its secular and remarkably modern construct has kept the song alive and vigorous despite the passage of centuries. Although it was just one of hundreds of verses, poems, and songs written by the poet-philosopher in his lifetime, it has come to define Narasingh Mehta's legacy. So completely has the song been identified with Gandhi that generations have grown up thinking that he wrote it, unaware of its medieval origin and even less of its original writer. Did you realize that Vaishnava Janato is not uh, Gandhi's? No, I didn't. Okay, uh, what was your conception of that? I thought you wrote it. Oh, really? For Gujaratis, uh, at least of my generation, our generation, uh, Narsi Mehta is an icon and uh, one can never ever take away anything from of his creation and ascribe it to anybody else, uh, no matter even if it was uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. And so 
I always knew that it was the creation of uh, Narsi Mehta because uh, there was so much. There, the, the, his, his life was so popular, so, so profoundly taught uh, to us that uh, we sort of became as intimate with Narsi Mehta as we were with Bapu. It is a matter of speculation when Narsingh wrote Vaishnav Janato, whether it was early in his poetic life or during the more mature philosophical phase later. Many scholars believe that since much of what he wrote in his younger days concerns the more colorful, joyous, and lovelorn aspects of his devotion to Krishna, it seems more than likely that he wrote Vaishnav Jan in his much older years as he became more reflective and declamatory in his writings. Javahar Bakshi, one of the best-known scholars of Narsingh's literature, thinks that it was likely in the latter half of his life that the poet wrote the song. Viewpoints in the researchers and the, uh, the literary commentators. One is that a young man is always ide idealistic and therefore it could have been written. And also to support that is that when actually Narsi evolves into God consciousness and he has dialogue with Krishna, then Krishna uh, gives him the vision of his Ras Leela, the cosmic dance. And then at the end he says that to ne vachan I command you to sing the glories of this Radha Krishna poems. And therefore he stopped all the knowledge uh, kind of poems, like I recited first Jagi ne Jogutu. And then he just merely wrote the uh, romantic poems embedded with the mysticism and the profound knowledge of Veda, embedded into it. The second viewpoint is that uh, uh, when you are through with the romanticism and in your older age when you are more mature, then you think of the mysteries of life and uh, the idealistic viewpoint. When you are in such a profound state of consciousness, when you are in tune with the entire universal consciousness, anything could have happened at any point of time. But surely, there was a period when he wrote about the Radha Krishna poem and he expressed this profound knowledge through the metaphor of Radha and Krishna. Radha being the nature and the manifest universe and Krishna as the unmanifest source, the universal aspect. But this is definitely a portrayal of a universal man and therefore uh, Surely it was not written during that particular period when he purely wrote the poems of Radha Krishna. But it is difficult to say it is earlier or later, but the consensus is that he, he wrote it towards the end of his life. Gandhi adopted it as one of the main songs to be sung as part of his daily routine sometime in 1907, when he was still a practicing barrister in South Africa. The song was very familiar to Gandhi because he grew up in the province of Surashtra, where Narsingh was also born and in whose air it reverberated. Tushar Gandhi, Gandhi's great-grandson, remembers the song to be always a part of his family life. Bank, uh, having studied in a Gujarati medium school, uh, it uh, sort of uh, was uh, there always. I, I can't remember the precise time or year or age at which uh, I got acquainted uh, with this uh, song, Bhajan. Uh, either it was in the family because uh, in my childhood we had this tradition of having uh, prayers in the family on the two anniversaries of Bapu and uh, so this was part of the prayers whenever they were sung and uh, then uh, because I went to a school which was run by freedom fighters who were greatly inspired by Bapu. Uh, Vaishnavajan was part of our uh, daily assembly. And so, I can't give you a precise date, but I think uh, it's part of my growing up uh, process. This uh, bhajan has been part of my growing up process. And like me, there must have been many uh, Gujarati students with, for whom uh, this was part of their childhood. 
What attracted Gandhi to the song was its austerely articulated message about who a truly righteous person is.
to engage with the person of the poet, but to their work. In a sense, the poet, no matter who, was incidental to the poetry. He was far more interested in what was written than in who had written it. It is certain that Gandhi knew about Narasingh's story very well because it was woven into the province's cultural fabric. However, his attraction toward Narasingh was singularly on the basis of just this one song because there is nothing to suggest that he read Maida's works extensively. Vaishnav Janato was in keeping with his approach toward life, where he drew his influences from eclectic sources, but there is little doubt that the song was consciously and subconsciously one of his defining influences. When I was a boy, I used to sing a song in the temple. Mm. A true disciple knows another's woes as his own. He bows to all and despises none. Like all other boys, I sang the words, not thinking what they meant or how they might be influencing me. Gandhi's relationship to work, works of literature uh, is uh, very, very of the very contemporary kind, uh, uh, where the creator is almost absent. It's his my engagement with the text, uh, which uh, it, it, I mean, don't wish to use the word. It's very post-structural. Uh, but the point really is that the author is in, immaterial. Uh, it's what I bring to the text uh, because the author has created the text and placed it in the public domain. And it's what I bring to my reading, my hermeneutic exercise with the text, my living the text, which provides and imbues it with meaning. So in that sense, it's a very contemporary engagement with the literary imagination. Uh, Gandhi does not necessarily read uh, um, an entire author. If we look at the Vaishnavajan as, as a song, as a poem, uh, it's unlike a lot of the poetry written during the Bhakti period. Unlike because it speaks of the devotees, uh, it does not speak of the relationship with the divine. It does not speak of pining and distance from the divine. It does not speak of a longing to be close to divine in whichever form. It does not even seek to describe the divine. 
what it seeks to do is to say, what is the self-conduct of a devotee? So I think for Gandhi, the importance is the self-conduct of, of the satyagrahi, the devotee, the ashramite, the prison goer. So for Gandhi, the importance, importance has always been on the self-conduct of the person, not necessarily the relationship with the, the divine. The relationship with divine is important, but it doesn't come to you as a benediction. You have to prepare yourself. You have to prepare yourself to be a satyagrahi, to be an ashramite, to be uh, a prison goer, to be... Uh, uh, to be a devotee as also and a devotee of truth. So in that sense, this is a very unique composition. It's a very unique, uh, it's a, you know, in, uh, in a way that it encapsulates uh, what the self-conduct of a person who seeks something larger than oneself, so who seeks something larger than, uh, um, you know, personal freedom who seeks larger than uh, personal proximity to divine, but is placed within the social context. Because here the devotee is relationship with the other, and the other is not the divine only. It is, it's the social, uh, the political, is actually enunciated. Because it speaks of how I shall conduct myself in relationship to you. How I shall conduct in, uh, myself in relationship to somebody who might be dispossessed. How I should, you know, uh, speaks of not coveting the neighbor's wife, as it were. Right? So it's it's about desire, and it's the desire has a play only when it's placed within a social context. Desire of an uh, of somebody who is in isolation, in seclusion, is not socially conditioned, is not socially contextualized. So in all of that, the song actually captures. Uh, the person, the self-conduct of a person. And for that, I think, in, to that extent, uh, the song becomes an exemplar. If Gandhi needed exemplars, the exemplars came from things like the song, came from the verses which said, uh, this is what a sthita pragya is, or uh, the Sermon on the Mount which says, this is the way you shall conduct yourself. So. Uh, I, I would do. I do say that yes, it becomes, in many ways, uh, the song of the ashramite. It becomes the song of the satyagrahi. It becomes the song of the social, uh, the prisoner. But it also becomes the so the song of somebody who lives in the society, because Gandhi's expectation is that we are not uniquely endowed, or he was not uniquely endowed, or the ashramites were not uniquely endowed, to lead the struggle or participate in it. Each one of us are capable in equal measure or maybe differing measure to participate in a movement of that order if we were to undergo a training of the body and the mind and the soul. And that is actually becomes in some ways a guidebook. Uh, and Gandhi always spoke of things which would guide him. And Vaishnavjan would be one of those things which would in that sense be an exemplar. A person who calls his uh, life an experiment needs to have benchmarks to compare the, uh, the results of the experiments with. And I think uh, this provided him, Vaishnavajan to provided him with a very simple, very uh, yet very profound uh, benchmark to challenge himself to aspire to. And I think that uh, journey began sometime in South Africa while uh, the barrister was turning into, as Nelson Mandela very famously said, uh, the saint. And uh, I think that is where, uh, uh, but I think uh, the seeds of the bhajan must definitely have been sown in his childhood. The pursuit of self-exploration. Uh, 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 was I think the reason that he picked on this because this was like an uh, 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 like a, a social uh, a s audit of his soul, you know, uh, putting his own life up to every point that Narsi Mehta talks about an ideal life, and then comparing how far he had reached up to that. Uh, when I started relating it with uh, episodes of Bapu's life, 
uh, it started taking much deeper uh, and philosophical meanings for me. In this song, he saw the potentiality of it becoming a tool of politics as well as morality and a tool for social reforms. For him, these three things were not parallel streams. They were, they were like a confluence of uh, reaching evolution, the, the moksha uh, belief. And I think that is where uh, this song became the tool of an activist, the, the, uh, the fountain of, of, of a spiritualist, and the inspiration of a reformist where uh, the whole, uh, the, uh, the whole uh, system of community was to be evolved according to this, uh, uh, you know, this, the, the, the definition of the ideal human. Uh, if you look at it, it is one of the most evergreen uh, uh, poems of its time because man is always striving for uh, perfection and this is not only a scale for Bapu, but a scale for anybody to uh, judge themselves or be judgmental also. You know, In today's time, people are being more judgmental about persons comparing them with what Narsimeta defined as the ideal uh, human being. So it provides uh, both uh, the, the quest for inner perfection as well as the uh, atavistic joy of criticism. You see, there is an uh, eternal element in the classics that have endured the uh, passage of time. The, this particular Vaishnavjan has come from a very deep-rooted experiential knowledge of Narsi Mehta. And it represents his being. And his being is that of a Vedic Rishi or an enlightened person who is in divine commune with the source of creation or the creator himself. The way it is is that Narsi had uh, done a lot of efforts to reach a particular state of consciousness. And in that state of exalted uh, bliss and uh, very profound knowledge, he found uh, that uh, what the uh, knowledge that was passed on from the Vedic Rishis for thousands of year, years, he sort of realized in his own consciousness. And uh, the, as a result of his various poetic incursions and uh, creative outbursts of poetry, he finally comes to this particular poem, which is held as one of the earliest classics in Gujarati language. And there he sort of, you know, uh, sums up the quality of an enlightened person as he lived himself. I think the family took it for granted that I was supposed to understand uh, this, but because it was a part of the Gujarati curriculum, it was uh, also part of our uh, textbooks. and. Uh, so it also was an exam exercise. We had to know the meaning of the bhajan to get the 15 marks that were reserved for its explanation. And so in every standard as we grew older, the meaning as we understood it become more, became more uh, astute. I won't say profound because it takes a lot to be profound, but at least astute. I think uh, it's, it's coming on uh, par with the Bhagavad Gita, the song Celestial, the way it has become a benchmark of uh, spirituality and duty. Vaishnavajan is ascending to that level where it becomes the benchmark for uh, humanity. And the magic of Vaishnavajan is that it is not, it is not a prescription for a saint. It is, it is a benchmark for a human being to become perfect, for a human being to become a good soul. You don't have to become a Mahatma to confirm with the tenets 
of Vaishnavaja. If you confirm with all the tenets or some of them, even some of them, you will definitely become a better human being, you will become a better part of the family, you will become a better cog in the society. And I think that is the charm of its, uh, uh, its eternity. It, that is the charm which continues to make it relevant in an age where none of those uh, ideals are in practice. In an age which is materialistic, in an age where the means do not matter as long as the ends are achieved, in an age where selfishness has become a virtue, this again is the benchmark of the soul. The soul is still beyond all those things. No matter how corrupt the body becomes, the soul, it's very difficult to corrupt the soul. And I think this song is that benchmark. As Narsi Mehta escaped into his, uh, his ideal uh, society, this song allows the soul to say there's hope. There's hope. You know, no matter how corrupt my being is, my, my soul, my atma has still got hope. The being of Narsi is that of a rishi or a person who is in deep commune with God. But the way it works is, Narsi himself says, a chetan chetan thayo, bhavatano agagayo, suti uthi mari adhyavani. That which provides sound to the birds, to the trees, to the wind, to the animals and to the human being, that is the source of the cosmic sound. And that exists in the deepest level of consciousness. The Vedic uh, rishis have created four levels of consciousness, one which is waking state, one which is little less conscious or dreaming state, third is a sort of deep sleep state, and the fourth is the state from where the entire three states come, and that is called the state of Samadhi. And there he is sort of metabolic rate is as low as it, the body could hold. And the intelligence has merged totally into nothingness. And there, after uh, repeated experiences of that stage of Samadhi, ultimately that which is the basis of creation starts putting ideas in his mind. And he actually can hear it like rishis. So that is called the Adhyavani or the primordial sound. But it is not a nonsense sound. It is a sound with the intelligence that is associated with the creation of the universe. And so it is that universal knowledge that pours out through his consciousness in his poems. And it is that which makes it eternal. And even after 500 years more, it will still be experienced as a fresh poem. If you go through the modern science, first we were told that there are four sources, four fields gravitation, electromagnetism, strong wing. Then Salam Weinberger made it three. Then Grand Unificationist made it two. And now there is a concept of unified quantum field, which says exactly what, uh, what uh, Narsi Mehta says, or what the Rishis said, is that the entire universe is built up of one uh, source. Everything has come out from one source. Now what the Rishis have seen is that it has three attributes. One is that inexhaustible energy. So the entire universe is sustained because of the energy of this Brahman or unified quantum field. Second is the principle of consciousness. The entire intelligence or the self-referral quality or the movement of any insect or animals or human beings is governed by this principle of Chit or Chaitanya. And third is that the nature of this is bliss. So the entire thing is created for the bliss of the Creator. And it is the Creator that enjoys through us. So if we are drinking a cup of tea, tea is also Brahman. The drinker is also Brahman. And the process of drinking is also Brahman. So with this uh, universality of mind, 
when Narsi writes, it has to be an eternal poem. The way it is, is that when you reach to that state of Turiyatit uh, or that Samadhi, the lively Samadhi, your consciousness becomes unbounded and you do not have any consideration of time and space. You have that enlarged mind and it never thinks of a very small section because what he says is universal truth and it is for every time, every person and forever. So that uh, enlightened man never has any sect or cult in mind. They are the games of small egos because the moment you qualify a truth, it is not universal. And that is what the sects and cults do. Whereas like Vedic Rishis, all the Vedas are very secular. They are no, timeless. They are spaceless and they are good for any generation. It is like Newton's uh, law of gravity or Einstein's law of uh, specific uh, relativity. So that relativity or gravity is not time bound. They are eternal laws of nature. And similarly, that thing, uh, the poems that come out are of the same quality. They are of universal nature and they are never meant for any time bound or space bound or a person bound audience. Meta would have gone down in history as a great poet, even with just bhakti or devotional poetry full of love and joy. In an extraordinary turn, though, he gradually became a profoundly philosophical poet, whose preoccupations became metaphysical, reflective, ruminative, and often remarkably full of self-belief. There is some evidence that he wittingly or unwittingly touched upon an aspect that much later came to inform a key area of quantum mechanics. The idea in quantum mechanics that it is the act of observation by the observer that makes the world come alive is touched upon in this particular work by Narasim. हूँ खरे तू खरो हूँ विना तू नहीं हूँ रे हैश त्या लगी तू रे हैश है हूँ खरे तू खरो हूँ विना तू नहीं हूँ रे हैश त्या लगी तू रे हैश है हूँ जते तू गयो हूँ जते तू गयो और निर्वाची रहो हूँ विना केह तने कौन कैश है अखिल ब्रह्मांड मां एक तू श्री हरि जूजवे रूप अनंत भासे देह मां देव तू तेज मां तत्व तू शून्य मां शब्द थई वेद वासे वेद तो एम वदे श्रुति स्मृति साख दे कनक कुंडल विषय भेद न होए घाट घड़िया पछी घाट घड़िया पछी नाम रूप जूजवा घाट घड़ी या पछी नाम रूप जूजवा अंते तो हेम नु हेम होए अंते तो हेम नु हेम होए अखिल ब्रह्मांड मा एक तू श्री हरि जूजवे रूप अनंत भासे उमा शंकर जोशी वन ऑफ गुजरात्स मोस्ट रिस्पेक्टेड पोएट्स literatures and language scholars, says what was unique about Narasingh was that his songs, ballads, and poetry were popularly consumed. Ordinary folks have sung his works over the centuries, often unaware of their creator. Narasingh has been widely regarded as Gujarat's pioneering poet, someone who laid down many parameters of poetry. Despite his preoccupation with the more metaphysical and more profound in later life, he is easily among the most widely recited poets in India in his native language. Part of Narsingh's enormous popularity can be attributed to his choice of Krishna as the receiver of his unbridled love and devotion. As a Hindu god, Krishna is perhaps unrivaled in terms of his popular appeal, which has a lot to do with the fact that in his human avatar, 
he has been ascribed many human traits, including his love for food as a child, particularly butter, and his love of women as an adult. Among Narsingh's more memorable songs is the one about a child Krishna trying to tame a monstrous, mythical serpent in a lake. During the medieval times in India, starting sometime in the 7th century, a devotional movement emerged that was called the Bhakti Movement, which was pioneered by a host of poet philosophers. The main feature of the Bhakti movement was that it liberated scriptural knowledge from the confines of the Sanskrit language and Brahminical elite and propagated the idea that moksha, or salvation, could be attained by anyone. Quite like the other poets of the Bhakti movement, Narsingh too has been attributed his share of miracles and the inexplicable, in a sense, those miracles have served the greater cause of keeping his lofty poetry alive for so long. While there are those who choose to focus on the miraculous rather than the poetic and philosophical, scholars such as Jawar Bakshi say there is no point quarreling with the former. Everyday readers of Narsin tend to lean towards the Narsin they believe had lifelong divine experiences and personal commune with an embodied Krishna. Scholars and serious students of his deeper philosophy tend to see them as something unfolding in his own mind and not in actuality. They believe the spectacle that Narsin wrote frequently about played out as a deeply personal experience within him, rather than externally. Narsi's bhakti, the devotion, derives from the uh, source of what is known as the crest jewel of the bhakti movement, and that is Srimad Bhagavat, which actually established Krishna as the hero and the uh, God, universal God. Now, uh, the other aspect is the Vedanta, the uh, abstract uh, universal wisdom. Now, the Brahma Sutra is the summation of all the Vedic wisdom and Upanishads. And it starts with uh, Athato Brahma Jigyasa. Now, let us uh, uh, unfold the uh, curiosity about Brahman. And then the very first after that is Janma Adyasya Yataha. That universal source which has no attributes, how do you describe it? So it describes it as that the Brahman is that from where the entire universe has been born, where it grows, where it is sustained and ultimately it will merge into it after it terminates. Curiously enough, this Bhagavata, the Granth of Devotion, Bhakti, also starts with Janma Dhyasyayata. And therefore, uh, Narsi's uh, being is very much in tune with the profound Vedantic aspect of Bhagavata, as well as the manifest aspect of Krishna. The miracles have been explained by the saints as only to increase the faith in the uh, Divine. Whether they have happened or not is a different matter. And I would not like to say a word about it because I do not want to break any. I personally don't believe in certain kinds of miracles. But those who believe in, I have no arguments with them. If the Narsin who conditioned the existence of the divine upon his own existence first was a poet at his philosophical peak, he was also someone who said a single force animates the universe. In his vision, that force was Krishna. The idea that the singular force was, as he wrote, the divine in the body, the element in the light, the word in the void creating knowledge, was extraordinary. In this particular poem, Narsin soars to heights of exquisite poetic simplicity when he says, This is a quest for the divine, not of the mind, but one realized by love. 
Director Christopher Nolan's assertion in the movie Interstellar that love trumps gravity was something Narsin had touched upon centuries before. So in his autobiographical poems, Narsin clearly uh, says that he has uh, had conversation with Krishna, but there he uses a very peculiar word, Sachu Swapnu, a real dream. Now the way it works is, uh, even Ram Krishna Paramans and later sets have explained it that all these things takes place within his consciousness. Even Narsi during his son's marriage or on his daughter's uh, other occasion, he says only I see Krishna, nobody else does. So our dekhe nahi. That means that uh, he, the mind projects, uh, but not his. Uh, on concoction that that divine re reality which is the universal reality within himself in spite of speaking through his thoughts he actually creates a projection within his mind and then he talks to him he sees him and and this is not a delusion as such but what he says that it is like a dream but because in dream the rapid eye movement your uh, consciousness is not uh, alert, whereas this real dream, he sees like a dream, but is fully alert, he is fully aware, his all senses are alert and uh, uh, listening. So there is no delusion as far as he is concerned. So the unmanifest aspect, like when we are quiet, we are unmanifest, and the moment a thought rises, we listen and then we speak it out. The unmanifest uh, uh, divine cosmic source, when it wants to say something, it projects itself and then it, it brings out that thought in such a way that he actually sees and listens. And therefore the Vedic wisdom, the richas, are called Shruti as well as Darshan, the visual as well as the listening aspect. So uh, this is what uh, Nurse's reality was that he was person in whom the divine uh, wisdom, the divine God was awakened and it was speaking through him all the time and whenever there was a special occasion, it would make a projection, his eyes may be open or his eyes may be closed in either way, but that creation is real and the dream is real. Narsin's preternatural capacity to poetically capture both the spectacular and the illusory about the universe and its mysteries comes alive in many of his creations. His song about the boy Krishna taming a monster serpent sets up a metaphorical conflict while his poem, You Exist Because I Do, underscores how the non-dual aspect becomes dual and puts self at the very core of all realization. There are dozens of verses where Meta talks of this theme. For instance, in the same poem, he says, As the form fades, so does the formless. However, perhaps there is none that is such a brilliant distillation of the thousands of years of India's ancient wisdom as his song, When I Wake Up. In the ancient Indian texts of the Upanishads, which contain central concepts of Indian philosophy about existence, there is a clear precursor to this song in these lines which talk about a particular state of deep sleep. It is in this beginningless illusion of the world that the soul indeed sleeps when it in sooth awakes. Then there awakes in it the eternal, timeless and free from dreams and sleep alike. Narsin captures the essence of this in his inimitably simple yet striking style when he says, when I awoke, the world disappeared. When asleep, bewilderment abounds. The disappearance of the world he talks about is perhaps what the Vedas regard as a fourth station of timeless and dreamless sleep, where existence 
seems to cease. It speaks of a state of sleep and wakefulness uh, and the, the, the period of transition uh, where one is awake but yet not awake. One is asleep but not yet asleep. When I awoke, the entire world disappeared. And then he says, Chitta Chaitanya Vilas Tadrupche. I find my consciousness and the entire goings on of the universe as if they are merged into one single entity. And Brahma Latka Kare Brahma Pase. And the entire dynamism of the universe, whether in either or in the galactic universe, any activity that comes forth is, I relate, as coming out of myself. So this is almost like a vision of Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. Jagine 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 Jogoto Jagat Di Senai Jagine Jogoto Jagat Di Senai Unguma at Pata Bogubase Unguma at Pata Bogubase Jagine 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 Chit Chaitan Vilash Tadrup Chai Chit Chaitan Vilash Tadrup Chai Brahm Lat Kakare Brahm Paase Brahm Lat Kakare Brahm Paase Jagine 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 Jogoto Jagat Di Senai Unguma at Pata Bogubase Jagine Jogoto Jagat Di Senai Unguma at Pata Bogubase Chit Chaitan Vilashuta the Rupuche Brahmulat Kakare Brahmupase Jagine 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 But a few imagined descriptions about uh, what Nursi Mehta's life might have been as he lay dying in his house. The best description probably comes from Kanayalal Munshi, one of Gujarat's greatest writers and literators, uh, who in his book Nursayo Bhakt Harino describes with such vividness that uh, that moment comes alive. And uh, this description is in Gujarati, but uh, it, it captures Narsi Mehta's fading moments the way only a great writer like K. Munshi could have. So let me read a little bit of a passage from that. Kanel Al Munshi is talking about moments before Narsi Mehta's death, and this is what he imagines it to be. Avaj Banditaiche. Bapor Pachino Surya, Chapra Parthi Niche Utarta, Potana Kiranothi, Shithil Tataim Nagatrone King Chetana Peche, Ek Pankti Adamberni Ashwashan Deche, Vaishnav Jan Have Suijao, Prabhu Koye Nirkache, Matajina Kane E Dhani Padeche, Timni Ank Hugadeche, Timnu Mathu Chuthaiche, तेव उंचे जुए छे, ने सुर्य बिम तेमनी सामें लटकी रहे छे, तेव पंडित तरफ जुए छे, 
નથી નિરખ્યા નિરખવા છે તેમના અવાજમાં પડકાર છે બધા જોઈ રહે છે એકદમ તેમના હાથમાં જોર આવે છે ને તેઓ કરતાલ ઉચકે છે એક સુકાયેલે કંતાયેલે હાથે તેઓ સૂર્યને સત્કારે છે અને કહે છે નિરખને ગગનમાં કોણ ઘૂમી રહ્યો નિરખને ગગનમાં કોણ ઘૂમી રહ્યો તેજ હું તેજ હું શબ્દ બોલે શ્યામના ચરણમાં ઈચ્છું છું મરણ રે શ્યામના ચરણમાં ઈચ્છું છું મરણ રે અહિયાં કોઈ નથી કૃષ્ણ તો લે નિરખને ગગનમાં કોણ ઘૂમી રહ્યો તેજ હું તેજ હું શબ્દ બોલે